Hi, everyone. This is Gideon Fiddles. I'm managing editor of PR Week. It's really excited about today's interview with David Chadwick, EVP, Global Head of Digital at GCI Health. David, how are you doing today? Doing great, Gideon. Glad to be I, here. Thanks. Oh, my pleasure. And what we're, we're going to talk about storytelling, uh, which is obviously a very important tactic <laughs> in the communications toolkit, something that comms pros have long done pretty well, very well, perhaps. but it's an, evolving, it's an evolving tactic, and things change all the time, and the way to do it right changes all the time. Couldn't find a better expert than David to talk about that, so I'm really excited to get into this conversation and help you in this podcast to make yours a story like no other. So, David, obviously you're in the healthcare space, so we'll start there. Healthcare communications and storytelling is unique from that of any other sector. There are regulatory issues that only pertain to it, and health is a topic with a particular personal importance to every consumer, especially now. So I think to set the stage for today's conversation, I'd love to get your take on the current state of healthcare storytelling, with a particular emphasis on how the pandemic has changed the game, both in the immediate as well as the long term. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so to, to set the stage for, for you know, the, the audience that isn't intimately familiar with healthcare communications, and it has really been a sea change over the last you know, year or so, uh, much like all of our lives, I suppose. Mm. But um, you know, the, the healthcare industry, I think, unfortunately, has been uh, a little bit behind the curve in overall storytelling. And you can you know, chalk that up to the inherent conservatism of the industry. And you know, a- as the sort of story goes, you, know, you can sort of trace everything back to uh, the uh, lack of regulation um, that, you know, tr- traditionally, you know, healthcare communicators in general, storytelling aside, um, I-, I feel like have been so reliant on FDA guidance here in the States, um, but regulation in general to be the guiding light of, you know, what it is that they can do, which makes a lot of sense. We're in a regula- you know, regulated industry. So, of course, you're going to look to sort of the, the rules of the road and the guideposts to, to help you along your way. But um, there, you know, uh, in, in the, I guess, 2000s, there was this real palpable sense that, you know, as social media was beginning to mature uh, and make its way from, you know, personal dalliance to uh, professional, you know, platform, um, there was this sense that these rules would be coming. And man, we are going to be just unleashed when those rules arrive. And uh, there was a series of uh, public um, uh, calls for uh, basically counsel from people in industry, people from advocacy groups, um, healthcare professionals, what have you, anyone that would be a relevant voice in the conversation. Uh, And that was done, you know, down in Washington. And uh, after, you know, a lot of excitement about, oh my gosh, here it is, you know, it's Christmas Eve, <laughs> um, you know, there were no packages under the tree, you know, the next day. And, and uh, we did get some guidance, but what we got was draft guidance, which went out of its way to say this is non-binding and this is, you know, um, uh, directional. Um, and even that was uh, almost a glancing blow of the regulation that people thought that they were going to actually get. And there was, you know, I I do chalk that up as an incredibly important moment, not necessarily for the guidance itself, although there was value in that guidance and I still go through, you know, I've got my, you know, somewhere around here, I've got my printout from, you know, eight years ago or whenever it was with highlights, you know, going all (laughs) throughout with the key points that I still reference, but, but more so than the guidance that was actually handed down. Uh, I think it was a, a pivotal moment because very soon after that, industry realized that there wasn't going to be guidance coming and that we really had to figure it out ourselves and, frankly, just apply the same norms that are in the typical guidance that would be for any sort of advertising or communication and apply mm-hmm. it to the social space. Um, and uh, I, I think that was what really allowed for industry to move forward, you know, you know, for all that time, having like one foot, just kind of, you know, bracing yourself for what was to come, then realizing it wasn't, you know, it sort of pushed us to, to make our own way. 
Mm -hmm. And it started in, um, you know, little baby steps and, you know, finally got to a place where now, um, if you look at like the half life of what it took from, this is actually an interesting analogy, um, to, to look at how much time it took from like a Twitter or a Facebook getting popularized in culture to healthcare industry use of it was like, 10 times as long as something like a, a TikTok or a clubhouse, you know, like some, some of these, you know, I, I, I guess you can't really call TikTok an emerging platform anymore. You know, gone are the days of like tiptoeing around these platforms, knowing that there is value and utility there, but not understanding how to, to go about it in a compliant manner. Now people are diving in. People are raring to go for like the new thing if, of course, there is value to be had in engaging with your audience on these platforms. So I think that alone has, has articulated how much progress has been made. Um, now, all of that was preamble, of course, to where we are today, right? That's, right. that's table setting. Um, but over the last year in particular, um, the acceleration of what I would call maybe the maybe the, the normalization of, of healthcare storytelling, and I am oversampling you know, quite a bit here on social here, um, but given how important that is you know, in the public discourse, I think that's, that's, where, that's, where, the story, that's where the stories are today. Yeah, I mean, right, totally, yeah. totally. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the, the, I, I say like the normalization of content, and what I mean by that is um, we as an industry have a lot to communicate that is um, in some cases complementary to the story that we want to tell, right? Mm -hmm. So all of the regulatory considerations and not wanting to, you know, the, 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 the nature of the stories that we tell are so important, right? Because the stakes are so high in, in a lot of these cases. And so there is a real sensitivity to that and wanting to make sure that um, we as an industry can get that right and, and obviously, instill uh, the perspective and the voice of the people for which we are speaking on behalf of, right? For people living with conditions, for professionals, for what have you, right? So um, th th there's a lot that goes into the planning for that. And there's a lot of sensitivity and, uh, you know, conservatism, as I was mentioning, about uh, making sure that we get that right. And as a result, you can feel palpably in a lot of content that comes out of the industry, um, that there was a lot of formal voice to that. And mm -hmm. there's sometimes a lot of things that make perfect sense if you are um, a medical reviewer who has you know, an MD or a PhD, you know, where you are artic articulating the exact scientific fact, but that uh, might not land for the layperson uh, mm -hmm. or even like the community oncologist that you know, isn't a, an opinion leader in their field. And so that I do feel at times can handicap um, the, uh, the ability to tell clear, cohesive stories. But the, uh, and I see you're trying to jump in there. Yeah, I, 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 it's, it, it's funny, David. I don't mean to interrupt you, but actually, Please. it's funny. I was, I, was, I was talking to my wife about this the other day. Um, and neither one of us are doctors, which might not, I bet you no one out there is too shocked to hear that. <laughs> uh, actually, I just insulted my wife. I didn't mean that. But I'm not a doctor, neither is she. But, you know, one of the interesting things that um, I always see when it comes to, uh, when it comes to drugs, prescri you know, drugs that are put out on the market, um, when, you watch, when you watch an advertisement, I'm, I'm sorry to use that as an example, but, they, you know, you see these really nice stories, and then about a minute, a minute and a half is devoted to, oh, by the way, this, these side effects could happen, and it is a, an encyclopedia of possibilities, and I'm like, whoa, I was really moved by that, but I just lost it when I was listening to all that stuff. I mean, sure. I probably can't take it because something's going to happen. And that's something that, that, listen, that's obviously something that's somewhat unique to the healthcare space. How do, how do communicators in this space tell a story about a new drug when, but still have to meet all those mandates about telling everybody you need to know that if you take this, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. That's got to be, an, that's gotta be a really interesting challenge, especially for someone who's clearly as creative as you are. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a challenge. And, you know, I could trot out, you know, cliches about how, you know, the, the more restrictions that we have, the more that it actually enhances creativity, because you got to figure out how to, you know, make your story sing in a box and all that stuff. But, 
you know, it can be very challenging. Um, and, you know, to, to your point about the, the, the uh, safety information, or as we call it, you know, fair balance in, in the industry. Um, yeah, you know, it, it, it can be seen as a punchline almost, you know, how many skits have you seen or SNL, you know, pieces <laughs> where, you know, they've got that as, as essentially like the lazy joke, but, but it is a responsibility that we have to tell people about that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, I do think that, you know, you, you mentioned that, um, uh, you know, you, you see this story of, you know, people that are, you know, painting a house or out kayaking or like something that feels very shiny and happy. Oh, and, and I'm over, I'm over generalizing here. Um, oh, no, I understand. And, and of course, industry wants to show you the benefit of what they can provide, right? And that's why you tend to get the rosy story followed by the, um, uh, you know, uh, disclosure. Um, but, uh, you know, I, one, one philosophy that I have is that I think, um, that too often we in the industry want so desperately, particularly when you're talking about, um, a particular product, want so desperately to, um, play up all of that benefit at the expense of the real human emotion and journey that uh, it takes to get to that resolution, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, for every, um, you know, uh, shot of shiny, happy people with like the family that's like smiling and triumphant, to get to that point, you've got a lot of hard conversations with your doctor. You've got probably months of like, what's going on with me and feverishly consulting with Dr. Google about, you know, what kind of symptoms you're presenting and a lot of anxiety and a lot, you know, th th this is, it's people's health. It's, it's of the utmost importance. And so um, I, I do think that there could be a better job uh, of industry overall in connecting with that because from my perspective, rather than, um, I guess in some way showing, you know, that, that um, I, as we call it, it, it's the tension in the story, right? Mm, yeah. um, I, that, that tension makes the resolution when you get there infinitely more powerful from my point of view than not showing any tension at all. I mean, it's like if you were going to write a novel and it's like you introduce your characters, characters fall in love, and then they live happily ever after you're going to have a pretty damn short novel and a pretty boring one as well. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, you know, I do think that in, in the, just the elements of story health aside, um, that tension is important and, you know, gosh, there is tension that it is, is, you know, uh, baked into the healthcare experiences of the, of the people that we, you know, are telling stories on behalf of. And so that, that tension, um, I, I do think is something that we should, um, confront head on and not shy away from in order to not only craft a better story and, and be more impactful for, for the people that are going to, you know, listen, but frankly, to better, um, articulate and carry the water of the people whose stories that we're telling, you know, you know, you know like, I'll tell you what, it's interesting because, um, David's really, really smart people because he knew that I wanted to talk about healthy tension because I think it's a really interesting concept and he just explained it really well, David. So thank you for that. But, you know, I want to ask you something maybe a little bit more direct, but I'm really curious what you'd say to this because, again, we're obviously doing, we're obviously doing this interview at an, at an historic time in our country's history and a, a country, world's history, let's be honest. And uh, so I guess I would ask you... Um, if there is one piece of content, and I know this is difficult, but I, I have to imagine you've thought about this. Um, if there's one piece of content that's really come out over the last year or six months or whatever, whatever the time period, whatever recent time period you want to look at, that's been really, really impactful to you as a consumer, not even so much as an expert, because I know you could dissect stories better than most people because that's what you do. But even as a consumer, What's come out over the last year, whatever platform it might be, maybe it was a tweet, I don't know, maybe it was mm -hmm. something a little bit longer than that, uh, maybe it was a short film you saw, I don't know what it is, but a piece of content over the last year that really, really stood out for you as being effective, sensitive to the times, yeah. um, you know, still within regulations, sure. uh, almost, I guess I'm almost asking you to sort of highlight 
a perfect piece of content that everyone out there could maybe go check out after this interview and say, you know what? Wow, this is something we can really aspire to. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's a great question. Um, and actually, it will. <laughs> I, I'm going to take this for a walk a little bit because I think that I can actually finally get to the answer of your last question on the state of the <laughs> while okay. I do it. Cool. But, um, but <laughs> to me, um, and this is going to sound like a gimme for, for people that are in the industry because it has been so ubiquitous, it feels like to me at least. But um, Pfizer's recent work overall, I think, has been stellar. And uh, in particular, the Science Will Win campaign. Um, and we didn't work on that, so I feel like I can, you know, say that. Say that. Excellent. You know, yep, Excellent. Yep. Totally. Good job. So, Good job, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, yeah. So, you know, to to sort of give a little bit of context of why I think it works so well. The everything that I talked about about the the sort of embedded conservatism and and uh, you know um, a little bit of arrested development in the maturity of the storytelling in the industry overall. Uh, that kind of went out the window um, pretty soon after we all found ourselves in lockdown. And it, it happened, I think, for two reasons. One um, was very pragmatic because the uh, production that uh, the, the industry is used to for uh, the majority, I'm not going to say all, but much of the content that does get you know, pushed out and the stories that are told, because these are large companies and because there is such sensitivity and regulation, a lot of cooks in that kitchen and lots of people that have very strong opinions on, you know, how something should look, how, how much sheen it should have. And, and that's sort of been the um, standard, not so much in terms of like standards of excellence, but standards in terms of just norms. Mm -hmm. And once we found ourselves in a position and Healthcare communicators, you know, basically overnight found that all of their plans for the year, and, and this is not unique to healthcare communicators, I should mm -hmm. say, but all of the plans, you know, those, those 2020 plans that have been baked months in advance, you know, gone. Yep. And so, you know, people had to pivot very quickly in order to figure out not just um, what they were going to do in the absence of their plan, but in uh, a situation where the ground beneath all of our feet was moving so rapidly and shifting. And so um, there was by, by sort of, uh, you know, what is it? Um, uh, uh, I'm blanking on uh, the, the idiom. And I, by the way, uh, grew up in the Midwest. Uh, I, I credit this to Peter Chadwick, my father, but I speak probably <laughs> 75% in like folksy idioms and, and cliches. So, uh, it's, it's, oh, I, I just, I, I just, but, I just thought you were being super cool. I didn't know that. That's cool. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm no, I think I, I'm like a, you know, a, a 65 year old in the body of a, you know, 35 year old. Oh my but, God. No, uh, no, no. But, but anyway, <laughs> to, to get back to That's it, a bad story, David. Bad story. Well, Hey, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm an old soul, but I, <laughs> That's I'm, good. I'm, That's I'm good. maturing into my, my, my dad joke phase to the point where it's uh, hard to ignore. Mm. Um, I digress. <laughs> So um, anyway, uh, necessity being the mother of, of invention here, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, almost overnight, and that's, that's an exaggeration, but almost overnight, you know, we had to change the way that we were telling stories because there was no other way to do it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, as that happened, um, by nature of whose stories we could tell, and, and honestly, like what the country and the world needed at the time, which was stories of inspiration and perseverance, and in particular, human compassion, mm -hmm. and he, like people making a difference, right? That is the stuff that not only broke through, but people desperately needed to hear when we all were looking to each other, you know, saying, what does this all mean? Where are we going to go next? What an uncertain future we're looking at, you know, boom, like that. And so I think the confluence of those two things um, set the industry in a position where they were at ground zero of expectation around swift communication and meaningful communication, you know, in a pandemic, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but now with sort of the tools or, or rather the mindset with which to create that in a way 
that um, other industries and storytellers have figured out by now, right? Mm -hmm. I think that, that that confluence really did elevate the, the impact uh, of the storytelling that, that we as an industry offer. Um, and ultimately created better stories and, and more impactful, you know, uh, sort of relevance for, for the people that we speak to. So with all of that said, um, Pfizer's Science Will Win campaign. I mean, Pfizer, obviously, at the epicenter of, you know, the pandemic in their vaccine development. And um, they, uh, I think, very astutely wanted to uh, simultaneously give people hope. Um, show their leadership that they were on the front lines of this battle and show all of the ways. And it's interesting because Pfizer has done this in past campaigns before at a corporate level, but show all of the ways that they, Pfizer, are not just um, uh, very well equipped from like an intellectual perspective to mm -hmm. tackle this, but also from like, like showing the commitment and compassion of all of the Pfizer colleagues of like, we are all, you know, running in the red to make sure that this gets solved. And the ability to ostensibly have a campaign, and sorry, I'm, I'm talking about this like everybody knows of campaigns. So Science Will Win was, was essentially an overriding um, series of messages that I believe that, that they're still using to this day. Uh, essentially telling stories about the perseverance, the grit, and the tangible uh, progress that was being made on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I don't mean that as a cadence thing, but I mean like, you know, everybody was just, you know, um, burning the candle at both ends to get this moving, the, right. the vaccine development in particular. But, um, but to tell ostensibly a science story through people. Mm. And I think that is genius right because it's it shows the personal story that audiences can connect to um while at the same time talking about the underpinnings of why they show their leadership which is a combination of that you know grit and and i don't know stick to itiveness i suppose that's and, that's underwhelming but mm -hmm. um uh but alongside that you know um that scientific intellect and progress so um and and they you know i i, I will say they were ready to meet the moment because they had been um, doing, uh, frankly, you know, for the industry, um, quite advanced content for some time. So they, they didn't just roll out of bed during the pandemic and say, okay, we got this. They were ready for it and um, had a very, you know, strong, not just structure from, from what I know from the organization in making that happen, but um, vision for modern storytelling in a way that when you look at that content you're not having that same uh sentiment of like man w what is all this you know mm -hmm. safety information or what you know and of course they don't have to talk about that because we're not talking about product small detail but um <laughs> no. uh but but it's the kind of thing where like it felt germane it mm -hmm. felt current and and you know that can't be taken for granted in in the industry that that we're in I want to sort of close this conversation with um, with something that could lead to you just emphasizing something you said before. It could be something new, but obviously we're in an age, and I'm not, this again, this isn't necessarily over the last year, but we're in an age where consumers are basically telling brands what they want very, very directly, and brands have to listen. So yeah. when it comes to creating content, again, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you for one thing, and you're probably going to say, I can give you 10, and I know you can. But if it's one, one thing from, the, you, you obviously are monitoring what consumers are saying about the brands that you work with all the time. If there's one thing a consumer has told you, um, whoever, whatever channels they might be, that has really, really impacted the way you think about content, let alone perhaps actually creating a piece of content or pieces of content, what would, you, what would that be? And I don't think I asked that as well as I could, but I think you understand what I'm asking. I think I, think I get where you're going with that. Yeah. Um, you know, Gideon, it's hard to pick one specific sort of eureka moment or like this is the thing that I carry with me um, beyond, uh, again, at, at a, a 5,000 foot view, um, you, you know, you just mentioned that, yes, we know that we have to listen to our audience and, you know, use that as a feedback loop to 
um, to, in order to make sure that we are providing what they need, right? But I think that that is not taken for granted with the level that um, certainly I would like to see, uh, again, at a, at a very high level. So to me, it's just making sure that we are making space to listen. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how often, you know, we can create, you know, amazing content strategy that is going to be impactful for the people that we are communicating on behalf of, right? For our clients, of course. And, and you know, the number of times that that has been sharpened by really great feedback from the people that are actually consuming that content after it goes live, I mean, it's endless. And, and I think that the most successful partners that we work with are the clients that understand that and, you know, make space for it too. Because again, with, with everything that I was saying before about the layers of oversight and how um, uh, we may not have the agility as an industry that others do, um, it's easier said than done when you talk about being able to create a true feedback loop. Um, in particular, if your content is baked, you know, in advance of where you're actually going to be pushing it out, and and that true, snappy, real time discourse is um, is challenging, you know, in some time. So um, I think that the 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 partners that understand why that's so important, and you know, in some cases, you know, people people can feel defensive about content, and and certainly storytelling, you know, it can be very subjective and you know, if there are um, sentiments that feel, you know, critical, um, it, it's all too easy to just sort of turtle up and, mm -hmm. and say like, oh, well, you know, that's a naysayer, you know. But I think if, if um, more partners, you know, and, and, and a lot of the partners that we work with get this now, and we work with them on this every day, but... Um, you know, that idea of like this, like use this, you know, like they, what you just got was someone telling you exactly what they thought of your content. And in many cases, what they would like to see instead. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can harness that, and of course, you know, you know, this is a business and making sure that business objectives are observed. Um, but you can do that while at the same time, creating something, especially in the attention economy, right? Creating something that is actually going to be meaningful, um, so that you know it can find an audience. I mean, to, to to put it in another way, and maybe this is a place to leave it. Um, would you rather have content that goes out there that is in full service to you, the speaker, that may never find an audience, or would you rather? Um, put something out there that, you know, might make some concessions on the initial message that you wanted to put out there, but actually has real relevance and resonance to the people that you're speaking to. Um, and that's a, you know, if, if you frame it in terms that are that simple, gosh, of course you're going to pick the latter, right? So. Yes. No, that's, that's, that's a one, that's a wonderful bit of advice. And it's a wonderful place to leave it to. And, you know, the whole point is that, you know, communicators, you know, I, I don't want to, the way I asked the question, and by the way, thank you for answering the question in a much better way than I actually asked it. But the truth is, is that it's not like communicators haven't been listening to consumers all along. It's just obviously their ability to do so with all the technological advancements is obviously much greater now. It would be a shame to not utilize that. But a lot of, a lot of communicators struggle with that. So it's, it's a really, really important point that you just made, obviously, among many that you made today. And, you know, clearly, David is somebody that I could listen to talk for hours. But um, you know, there are, there are time limits to things, even in the virtual world. So David, I really, really want to thank you, um, for spending some time with me today. I know how busy you are. Um, but, um, it's really inspiring and, you know, storytelling is something that is just obviously crucial to the comms industry. Um, and though it's always done a really good job at it, things change. You have to get better at it. You have to constantly evolve just like you are. And um, I really, really appreciate the counsel and the inspiration you offered me and to all of our audience today. So thanks for joining me. And, um, you know, all, everyone out there, thanks for tuning in today as well. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. And Gideon, the yeah. pleasure was all mine. You know, look forward to having more conversations like this. But thank you again. <laughs>